Well, today the hot news this week has been Simone Biles' decision not to proceed in the Olympics. And um, what forgetting that as an individual decision, article after article in The Atlantic and The New Yorker, New York Times, all of the progressive press has the same reaction. This decision not to go through with our performance is a completely positive sign that shows we're having a breakthrough in America in mental health. Um, and it's, it's usually when they describe this, they, they use a couple of key words. Um, it's, they talk about people under pressure. They, the word pressure will appear five and 10 times in the conversation. And they'll say people realize, have to realize when they're under that kind of pressure that if they want to drop out or turn to therapy, they should do that. And everybody lauds Biles for prior, the other words are prioritizing mental health. And a no-no is something called stoicism, which we'll discuss later. So right on the ground floor, I want to lay out, we're not here to criticize anything about Simone Biles, if she, she knows her decision matrix, she knows her physical and mental state. Uh, we have no, if she's aware that she's in some kind of danger, that's 100% her decision. In, in addition, people discuss her background, and I believe she's one of the people that was assaulted by Larry Nassar, who was a physician for women's gymnasts and that whole thing has to be thoroughly explored not only in her psyche but in terms of that organization right but here's the questions that we want to discuss will she be happier for that decision well we don't know and it's not our decision to make will americans be happier using her decision matrix not being stoic, turning away from work and other obligations to tend to their mental health. We have a clear answer for that. And I, I believe it'll be apparent by the end of this podcast, the answer is no. And uh, let me just take one little side path. In the light process program that Zach and I are involved in, um, how do we deal with people's engagement in life in regards to their addiction and mental health? First thing is to try to do a proper self, proper might not be the right word, but a self-evaluation that includes the joys and the good in their life. So to take that into the context of the decision or the thought that there's something going awry in their life, because if there's something going awry, that means there's something, there's a path that they are familiar with that they want to continue on or maybe even improve. And I would take it one step further and say, we feel that their engagement in life is a positive. We're going to try and build on their positive engagement, which is sort of what you're saying. And we, we view that as the foundation of their existence. We're, we're not people who say, oh, well, leave your family or leave your relationships or leave your work accomplishment. We don't say you've ex done something exceptionally well, ditch that. What you're saying is actually a little bit better than what I said. It's what I meant, but where I, I sort of laid it out, you could get the you could get the uh, the suggestion that life is something that just kind of happens to you. But you're talking about engagement with life, so something that you can take hold of. Your mental health is not. Oh, there's a separate category out here. That's my mental health. Right. Oh, here's my life. To heck with my life. So I, first, I want to give a little bit of a tribute to Simone Biles. Um, I don't know if this is emphasized very much or people are mainly aware of it. Simone Biles had a mother who was incapable of raising her around her drug issues. Simone Biles is one of four children and all were in and out of foster care. And she was eventually adopted by her mother's father, Ron Biles and his wife. And Ron Biles' sister adopted the other two children. So, Right away, you know, I'm, I'm going to bring up the name Gabor Mate. If Gabor Mate is searching among people, 
hard to find their trauma, you don't have to search. Right. It's Mom Bile's life. Her mother gave her up because of her drug problems. And she was in foster care up until I think the age of five before her grandfather adopted her. That's as much trauma as any human being needs in life. And instead she became one of the most distinguished people in the world, the best ever at her occupation. I'm jumping now, the gun, but let me plant the seed. So I can safely say, I, I believe our one issue that we take with Gabor Mate's overall philosophy is that he would say, is something bad happening in your life now or something, you know, some negative event? If it is, then let's look to that past. Oh yeah, you do have a lot of trauma back there. We, on the other hand, are saying, look, you had all these traumas, yet you became this thing. You're still, you're, you're fully engaged in this miraculous kind of, you know, involvement in your life. How did that happen? Let's, you know, let's go with that. And it's possible, we're not here to evaluate Simone Biles' life. Mm. He made a lot of sacrifices to become the, to become the greatest in the world in something. You got to focus. But um, she was homeschooled. You know, she didn't have a lot of spare time. She was accepted to UCLA after the, until after the 2016 Summer Olympics. And she decided not to go, which is, again, if you're the greatest in the world, and she's a professional, if you want to forego college because you've got something, a skill that, you know, <clears throat> is only going to last a certain amount of time, um, then it's, uh, that's a decision she's going to make. But you might say she made certain sacrifices to be the greatest in the world. They're not due to her trauma. She, she didn't have a normal, perhaps, involvement in what many of us would consider the institutions of life. Um, so the good about her decision was she didn't see the Olympics as a be all and end all in her life. And she decided to take care of other parts of her life. That's good. But the way that played out is, <clears throat> well, that's a choice that a human being has to make within the banner of all eyes on mental health awareness, that there's this mental health thing, as we discussed, that she, that she decided to take. Um, She, you point out, she has been taking um, ADHD medicine all along. Um, oh yeah, I threw I threw a, a curveball in there for you. We're, Go ahead, we're, <laughs> pick, it up, pick it up for me. Well, it's just just an added, you know, as you mentioned, we don't know anything really about her life or what her focus is on or should be on or anything like that. We can grant that being an Olympic athlete is not something that you or I know something about, but but it has to take some amount of distracting or putting out other things in your life to be able to focus on. And recently it's come out in Japan that she's been taking ADHD medicine. She's been taking Ritalin and she had to sort of defend herself and say, well, I've been taking it since I was young. And this is another kind of interesting uh, take that it would be different than ours. She, her defense for taking ADHD medication is that, well, I have ADHD and it's like an ailment and I, I have to take it. I've been taking it since I was younger. And that's caused a lot of, we don't need to get into that, but that's caused a lot of pushback and disruption in her, probably her mental space for training for the Olympics. So as a young lady who's, who's pouring her all into this, that as an added burden and distraction, I'm sure fed in, I don't know, but I can imagine fed into her decision to say, <clears throat> things are chaotic right now in my life. I need to take a pause. There was a lot going on, some added turmoil. I think another way, what we're talking about is not having a division line between life and mental health. That's right. And, that's... and so you and I might tend to say, if somebody is completely focused on something and they need to be completely focused on that to become the greatest in the world, you and I would explore that with them. Right. We'd say, well, do you want to be the greatest in the world? Ritalin is a drug that helps you concentrate. You know, when you're doing, people take Ritalin to study and we might 
again, this is totally speculative of explore with our, do you feel you're giving up other aspects of your life in order to do this? Mm -hmm. What is it that you're using Ritalin not to concentrate on? And are those things that you're not concentrating on um, something that you miss, that you're going to miss? That would be our job. You know, it's not our job to decide which path she takes. Being the greatest in the world at something that goes down forever in history is a choice that some people make. Yeah. She has the right to make that. So in the same programs, but when I watched MSNBC this morning, they focused on how brave and mental health sustaining it was for Simone Miles not to tough it out and to quit. In those same programs, they then talk about Suni Lee, who was the woman who replaced Simone Biles. And this is, I'm quoting just from things in the paper. Lee got her opportunity and seized it. With Russian women's gymnastics team leading by more than a point, and Simone Biles abruptly out of the competition in Tuesday's team final, it fell to Sunisa Lee, anchoring the United States on the uneven bars to keep the American gold medal hopes alive. Uh, Sunisa Lee is 18 years old. Hmm. I, I don't know, do, do 10 billion people watch the Olympics? Is everybody in America watching the Olympics? Oh, by the way, the greatest gymnast in the world has just quit. Uh, we were depending on you to beat the rest of the world. See you later. Um, Lee said afterwards, it was, quote, the most pressure I've ever felt in my life. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <clears throat> so she might have said, you know, I'm only 18. I was second in the line. I don't want to do this. That's one possibility. Um, but it, I'm, again, I'm quoting this. I, I'm not making this up. The most pressure I ever felt in my life, it didn't show. Lee turned in a grace under pressure performance for the ages during Tuesday's team fine, final. So on the same program, they'll say, well, okay, it's so great that Simone Biles recognized this pressure. They kept using the word pressure and left. And then they say, can you believe this woman, 18 year old woman with all that pressure on her performed so fabulously? At a minimum, there's a little bit of a split in our thinking. So where does Lee come from? And in these same specials, while she's really tense, you know, everybody in the world, why I have to carry the entire United States team? She called her father. So is that a mental is that a mental health break? She's very close to her father. Mm. Is that a mental health break? It's it is seeking support. Right. I have a feeling. I have a feeling. I don't know that Sinisa Lee comes from a background where they didn't resort to mental health professionals a lot. That she didn't have a personal psychologist. I mean, she called her father. So she's so, not saying I need to just pause on this and sort things out and then maybe I'll return. She's saying, this is the thing that I'm doing. I'm going to seek on the resources I have, including her father for support. And they so, and her father is not a mental health professional. He's an immigrant, to say the least, said the right thing. I mean, he said, do work within yourself. You know what you can do. Do that. That's the standard you don't have to get a PhD to understand that, you know, do what you can do. And I, I believe that what you can do will be the best in the world. Mm. And that turned out to be right. And when you think, well, I'll do what I can do. You're going to be in a better place for years. The gymnast Sumisa Lee wasn't training just for herself. I'm reading from quotes. Lee is a Hmong American from Minnesota. She went to the gym every day for all the people whose quote, Parents had immigrated to the United States with nothing after escaping war zones. She endured grueling, painful practices to honor her father, John, who put her in the sport when she was six and who now uses a wheelchair because of a spinal cord in injury. I mean, I assume I'm like everybody else in America. Uh, 
I don't know what homonyms are. So I just, this is what it said in Wikipedia. Laos and Vietnam-based Hmong animists and Christians, including Protestant and Catholic believers, have been subjected to military attacks, police arrests, imprisonment, forced disappearances, extrajudicial killings, and torture on religious grounds. In some areas of the world, they don't mess around. If you're from a minority religion, that's what they do to you. So again, we can return to Gabor Mate. I mean, I know a little bit of Gabor Mate's story. Gabor Mate, I believe, says he himself was addicted due to trauma he experienced in utero. I, I believe his family were Jews in Hungary. I believe they escaped the Nazis, but he feels the anxiety of that pursuit was something he experienced prenatally before he was born that impacted his life. I, I'm, Again, I'm not here to evaluate anti-religious purges and Holocaust, uh, but Sunisa Lee's family and the people she knew experienced these things quite directly. And is that traumatic? Was she traumatized? Sounds traumatic. I don't know that she, I guess, being traumatized is all in the perspective. But we talked about it the last time. She's a part of an immigrant population. They were glad to get here. Mm. Compared to that, they said, wow. I mean, there may be people who are prejudiced against us, but nobody's going to imprison us or kill us. Not, you know, again, well, if, there's, if they experience bias, I'm not here in America. We should stamp that out. But America was a pretty good deal for them. And so uh, these are two narratives, the Biles narrative and the Lee narrative. Neither of them respects the trauma narrative. Oh, you're traumatized, you're permanently damaged. It'll show up in one form or another. Whatever trauma they had individually or culturally for Biles and Lee it played itself out in various ways both positive for Biles and negative, as you pointed out. You know, right now, Lee at 18 is a world hero and she's a family hero. And one of the best things about the Olympics, I watched them fairly closely, is they flash to the support team back home. And for Lee, when she went, they had more people in the room that you, they can't all be her relatives. There's like a hundred people in somebody's living room jumping up and down. She has a support network. And that support network is living and breathing every second of what she's doing, including her father. He's in the middle. And all a whole lot of people, I don't know how they're related to her. So that's a different model than, well, when you're under pressure, you quit and you seek mental health sustenance, which every outlet in America says, well, that's, a, uh, they say this is a turning point in America, showing people that they should seek mental health support, possibly leaving behind their obligations when they're under duress or stress. And uh, we talked about how in the life process program, we don't think exactly that way. We think about people being engaged as a positive component of mental health. And now I, um, so now I want to switch to America's mental health. America's mental health isn't good. Um, you and I have in the past, the World Health Organization did a global burden of disease and America is number one in lost life years, quality life years due to drugs. And number two, out of 167, 167 nations, rich, poor, strife torn, we're number one in life years loss, quality life years loss for drugs, and number two for mental illness. We're doing very, very poorly at it. And we have the most elaborate and expensive healthcare and mental health care system in the world. So I'm going to switch now to another part of the New York Times. 
um, What's Ripping American Families Apart is the name of a column by David Brooks. He pumps those articles out, doesn't he? What? Is it he really pumps those articles out, doesn't he? Yes. And, uh, well, that title's not pussyfooting around, is it? No, no, no. And, you know, you might read that and say, what's ripping American families apart? Are American families being ripped apart? And we just live here. <clears throat> and so I'm going to quote, and I have a subtitle here. Forgive me, it's called, I call it the Gabor Mate story. Now I'm quoting directly from David Brooks. At least 27% of Americans are estranged from a member of their own family. And research suggests about 40% of Americans have experienced estrangement at some point. 40% going on half of Americans have had a fundamental estrangement in their nuclear family. Huh. Now, if you went back to that group of 100 people that Lee belongs to, they wouldn't even understand that. Right. We're estranged from your family. Your family is your family. They'd be thinking like you got lost or something. Right. It's fundamental. It's like air. I'm not getting estranged from my father. That's not a possibility. I'm reading from David. This is all direct quotes. The parents in these cases are often completely bewildered by the accusation. They often remember a totally different childhood home and accuse their children of rewriting what happened. As one cutoff couple told the psychologist Joshua Coleman, emotional abuse, we gave our children everything. We read, we read every parenting book under the sun, took her on wonderful vacations and went to all of her sporting events. Part of the misunderstanding derives from the truth that we all construct our own reality. I mean, two people living in the same reality, live different realities. But part of the problem, as Nick Haslam of the University of Melbourne has suggested is, I put this in bold, there seems to be a generational shift in what constitutes abuse. Or we might throw the word trauma in there. Practices that seem like normal parenting to one generation are conceptualized as abusive, overbearing, and traumatizing to another. Does that remind you of anything? Yes, yeah, sure um, does. When Gabor says, is there anybody in this room who's had a problem, mental health or addiction, drugs, and doesn't think they were traumatized, raise your hand. And somebody raised their hand and he explains them, and in case you witnessed, they, there was some kind of bullying in school and they didn't tell their parents. Gabor explains to them in the audience that that was a trauma. In his book, he says, you know, trauma is something if your parents are working and they're not home when you come home from school, that's traumatic. Gabor, I won't, as much as any human being on the planet, Gabor Mate has expanded the notion of what trauma and abuse means. And of course, the view is, well, that's so helpful. That's not the way David Brooks is going. David Brooks is saying that's, a factor that tears families asunder, explaining to them that their interactions by well-meaning parents were actually traumatic. And this is, I'm quoting David Brooks again. Either way, there's a lot of agony for all concerned. In other words, after Gabor explains to somebody, oh, you were traumatized, does that make their life better? Are they gonna sit there and think, huh, my parents abused me by not being home every day when I was there or where I didn't feel comfortable telling them somebody picked on me at school. Either way, there's a lot of agony for all concerned. The children feel they had to live with the legacy of an abusive childhood. The parents feel rejected by the person they love most in the world, their own child, and they are powerless to do anything about it. There's anger, grief, and depression on all sides painful holidays and birthdays, plus the next generation often grows up without knowing their grandparents. Huh. And I'm gonna hit summary paragraphs. I gave you some statistics. I write about this phenomenon here because it feels like a piece of what seems to be the psychological unraveling of America. Zach and I didn't make this up. We're just reading David Brooks here. 
the psychological unraveling of America, which has become an emerging theme of mine. Terrible trends are everywhere. Major depression rates among youth aged 12 to 17 rose by almost 63% between 2013 and 2016. American suicide rates increased by 33% between 1999 and 2019. The percentage of Americans who say they have no close friends has quadrupled since 1990. 54% of Americans report sometimes or always feeling that no one knows them well. What does that describe about a society, those statistics? They we're describe, not, go on, I'm sorry. Well, that we're not connected. I mean, is the person who Gabor asks, you know, did you experience uh, trauma? Well, let me show you. Who do they have now? I mean, if they're supposed to become estranged or if they're supposed to distance themselves from the people who caused them, quote, trauma, I mean, is Gabor going to fill in? Is he going to be a paternal role? I, you know what I mean? So now we're left to our own devices with this understanding that the people who love us, despite, you know, what bumps and bruises you may have faced along the way, are not supposed to be a part of our lives. So it's we, we talk about personal agency, which is in a sense individualistic, saying you take control of your own life. But we don't say take control of your own life by getting rid of all the other people in your life. We say... Take control of your life and the relationships that you have in life, as and opposed to. One of the to... aspects of uh, recovery is community, and one another one is intimacy and family, which are right. separate things. Right. And we're losing them rapidly. And is the traumatization of America and North America? How is that helping in that process? And let's go back to Lee. I get. I mean, Lee could say, well, how did her father, there's a thing where her father put a uh, four by eight in the backyard for her to do exercises on. You know, I don't, did she say, dad, I'd like to do exercises on that four by eight beam? Or did he say, you know, you might like to do this? That could be an element of trauma in some thinking, somebody's thinking, what, what was she, six when she, that happened? <laughs> So, the, as you say, the decision about whether a relationship or involvement, how that plays out is positive. It's, you know, human interactions have good and bad as a part of them. That's just the way it is. But fundamentally being connected to other people is the strongest thing that we have. And in America, we've decided to ex source out that support. Well, I need some support. So, you know, I have a coach or I have, you know, a mental health professional mm. and, you know, I'm not going to seek my parents who in fact, more and more often, uh, there's, they may be estranged from 40% have had that experience. And so we're getting back to all of those headlines that say, Thank God, uh, S S Simone uh, Biles has shown the direction for America to become more mentally healthy. And we're the least mentally healthy country in the world. But at least, and the funny thing is, the very statistics that show that we're the least mentally healthy country in the world are the ones that people cite positively. Oh, so many people are seeking mental health aid. Right. So many people are taking antidepressants. That shows how much we're paying attention to our mental health. But there's another way of looking at all of that. And so I guess we've made our point of view fairly clear. Um, going back to Lee, Susima Lee, I'm sorry, Sunisha Lee, forgive me. So she's 18. She's got to do those exercises, the vault and the mat exercise. You know, you can't screw up. If you step outside the boundaries 
of the mat in the floor exercise, they take points off and then your country doesn't win the Olympics. Whew. Um, and yet, what is it called when you get up and do that anyhow? And that's called, uh, is that called stoicism? I want to turn a little bit over to you. You're a little bit more of an expert on the philosophical category, but people use that specific to term and they rewarded Biles by saying, well, she's given up her stoicism. And in my mind, stoicism means you have certain obligations or you fall into a category and you're supposed to perform. And, you know, sometimes you're not feeling that well about it. I, I you know, I, I'm 75. I don't believe that I've ever not given a speech because I was ill. So I get, you know, somebody might say, what's the matter with that guy? Is he inhuman? Does he not recognize his own body workings? I had to argue in front of the Second Circuit Court of Appeals for a woman who was being drug tested for six years because she had a point 0.01 alcohol, 0.02 alcohol level with for one beer at lunch. And when I got up that morning, the second court of appeals, that's a, just before the Supreme Court, I was a little tense and I had tremendous back pain. I didn't have a legal team. If I didn't, they don't care. If I don't show up, everything, you know, bye-bye. They don't have a sick leave for an attorney sole attorney representing somebody before the second court of appeals that doesn't exist and so i went and i never missed a professional appointment am i unfortunately is that stoicism and is that a bad thing so let me i know you've had people talk about stoicism from a philosophical standpoint maybe you can just pick up a little one stoics good and bad well suny lee was practicing stoicism and it's I mean, most popular form where you say things are happening in my life. Some of them are negative, but you know, you, you look back at, let's say your grandparents or your great grandparents or your ancestors and say, wow, life is really good for me right now. I mean, even, even in the roughest times, you say there are things about life, me living now that are just incredible. And then you take that perspective and you do things that are in your control to do. And that's like when COVID happened and when everybody was sitting in their homes, there was a meme that was generated, a photo that was generated that was saying, you know, your circle of influence or circle of control or something like that. And people, the suggestion was try to drop the things that you're so anxious about that you can't possibly control. Something's going to unfold, something's going to happen. But for now, look out your window and like what's going on in your living room or whatever. And you can worry, but worry to the extent that you know you can do something about the worry. So what is it, what's in your control to do? I think that the, the destructive stoicism, as people describe in Bile's case, is the same thing as, like you saying, love addiction. It's not stoic to do something despite it's causing turmoil in your life. So you might say that there was turmoil in her life. I don't know. Who knows about this? But And she decided to do the right thing. We just don't know. But what you can't really say is that it's because she was too stoic. It's almost like a an oxymoron. Being, being stoic in its, you know, radical form really means that you have a, you have a really tight, healthy perspective on what you can control in your life and the positives in your life that you also have control over as well as things that, you know, may beset you, but you can kind of put those in their proper place in your mind. Another way of calling another label, it seems in these cases for stoicism is obligations to others and responsibility. Mm. Um, I, I, my children don't want me to talk about their work lives my wife and I always emphasize responsibility. 
And all three of my children at some point in their lives had a kind of a supervisory position. And all of them at one point or another expressed this feeling to me. I had somebody working for me, somebody under my direction or an intern, and like they were supposed to do X and they didn't, and they like didn't even call. And then I talked to them and I said, well, I had to go to the dentist. And all of my children go, huh? You know, you have a job. Yeah, yeah. There's, and, there is, a, there is. I mean, the Stoics, ancient Stoics talked about this temporal dimension of Stoicism where you look forward to you in time and think about the things that you have control over in, in your responsibilities in the future. And then you put that in perspective in the here and now. And so that the future responsibilities are included in what's important right here and right now. And you can kind of take good perspective on that. Whereas like longing for something in the future or dreading the future is, is anti-stoic. And you and I talk about, I mean, we've written a book called Outgrowing Addiction. I previously had a book called Addiction Proof Your Child. We're about linking childhood to avoiding addiction. And that's something, you know, we try to emphasize. It seems to be a hard sell to people to see the connection between those two things. But when I do an exercise, I say, well, how many people in this room have taken a painkiller? An opioid painkiller. And, you know, everybody raised their hand. I say, well, how many of you became addicted? Nobody raised their hand. I say, well, probably some of you thought, huh, that experience is pretty good. I'm okay with it. But you still didn't keep taking it. And then I'll call on someone and I'll say, well, why didn't you keep taking it? And they say, well, you know, I have children. Mm. I have a job. I have a life. I have obligations. And they would be, you know, if you said, are you a stoic? They'd say, huh? I'm just, right. a, I'm a person in a situation connected to work and family and a community and an employer and coworkers. They expect me to do X, Y, and Z. I'm happy to do that. That's how I have a salary and a family. Um, I'm, you know, unlike Simone Biles' mother, you know, there are parents who want to fulfill their obligations and feel it's ne necessary. And so you could say stoicism is an anti-addiction mechanism, doing what you feel obligated to do as a human being, as a, who you are in life, that's a mechanism for not saying, well, screw that. I'm just going to go out and take drugs or gamble or have sexual, whatever. Instead. You could even say, like, I, I, I keep wanting to run this hypothetical, but I mean, you could even say that Biles is being stoic in some circ if if the circumstances were right, if she could actually look at the Olympic Games and her involvement in them, and then the rest of her life and her involvement in it, and say there's something that's just not clicking here, then it, it could be a stoic move to say life is important. Olympics are you know they're they're a construct and they are they've been important to me, but life is also important and I have to make this tough decision to make the switch. The thing that we'd be pushing against then is the response to this. And, and maybe even her um, her saying it's because of mental health, you know, mental health caused this or people's response that, um, well, isn't that good? This is a victory for mental health awareness or something like that. I, I want to say, I'll even say more positive things about Simone Miles. I read, I read an explication of what she said about why she had to quit. She felt that she was off the top of her game. Mm -hmm. And in the things that she does... If you're off the top of your game, you can name yourself. So you could say, well, that's not going to be good for me. It's not going to be good for my team. The second thing was, and I'm just going to give her 100% credit for this. She stayed with her team even when she quit. Mm. And they lost the team thing the day she quit. But they won with her replacement. So she actually did the best thing for her team yeah today. she right. was fulfilling her obligations to herself and we don't like to say well it's either or and her team and the woman behind her won and if she's got the guts to say well i'm not 
the best in the world right now. Somebody else just won the Olympic all around. If she can deal with that, then that's more power to her. So you, you can say a lot of good things about her. And, and you and I, I think, would tend to say if you're really doing the most healthy thing for yourself, you're probably doing the most healthy thing for your family and your group. Right, right. So in other words, we're uh, not really accepting of the narrative that's been constructed around this. On the other, let's say she were a client, we might try to give her encouragement about the decision that she made being the right one, but just kind of frame it differently and positively and let her move forward with it so that she doesn't incorporate this event as a trauma in her life moving forward. Would that be the worst outcome that she said, oh, I traumatically left my team and they fell apart. Right. And I, she did the best she could. She came back, supported them, and they didn't fall apart. So it could be framed as a triumph of, like you said, kind of stoicism, making really practical decisions and healthful decisions. So you and I are kind of anti-trauma guys. Uh, I mean, we can't declare that Miles didn't have trauma when she was put in foster care. Sure. We can't declare that the Hamang didn't have trauma when they were doing whatever was being done to them. But what you and I would emphasize is let's cut out the trauma trap from here going forward. You know, right now we're talking no more traumas. Well put. Yeah, well put. We're over, you know, whatever traumas have happened in your life before they're not happening from here on in. That's the best that you can do in life. In our so, formulation, we can say this is too bad that this has happened. Wow, she said a tumultuous kind of life. It's understandable that at, at this point in time she'd make this decision. And also, we can still say good on her for sticking with her team, for doing all these positive things, and don't let this be a, a road bump that deters you from living your best life. So we can still have all the positivity that I think is meant from this nar mainstream narrative without the, the bogging her down of needing to claim mental illness or trauma or, or so forth. And... Another positive thing I'll say, Biles didn't say, oh, I'm going to go directly to a psychiatrist. Mm. She said, I'm going to take care of myself. I, what that means. And by the way, I want to throw in one other last name. Michael Phelps was is the, per I don't know who's won more Olympic gold medals, Michael Phelps. I think he's won more than, than anybody. He decided he had mental health problems after he retired. He never right. didn't do anything. And, you know, that's a standard kind of narrative when you're a super duper star and that stops happening, that can kind of leave a blank in his life. In New York City, I've seen him on subway ads where he says, oh, go to this psychological service. It really helped me. And I assume they pay him money to do that. Hmm. He was a commentator on the Olympics. And A, I count that as a job. Uh, anybody who has a job gets paid, I'm... I'm good on that. <clears throat> and B, I listened to what he said. He did not say that Simone Biles, he didn't say he should seek psychiatric help. He said she should seek support. And then he, he made, he said this, when I was swimming, nobody ever once asked me, how are you doing? How are you feeling right now? Hmm. That's not psychiatric help. That's like an organization that takes account of you as a human being. And I right. go, well, that's, I'm for that. Not bad. Yeah. Uh, you know, he, he at least, uh, you know, the Michael Phelps I saw on television last night, but the other night, um, I was commenting on Simone Biles, was not hacking uh, professional therapy, medications, or psychiatry. He was saying, and this is, I think, where we're coming out with Sinisa Lee and her family and what the whole David Brooks shtick. What we're missing in America, what is missing from many people's lives and from organizations is a human dimension that supports that person and their spirit and their achievement and their obligations 
on a mutuality and an attachment and on a connection basis. We're for that. And uh, as I said, marketing that, outsourcing that, saying, well, okay, all of those things, well, you can buy them, you go to a professional and get them. We've lost something really crucial in our world and our lives to the extent, and, it, we, and it's a large extent that we've done that. All right, we did it. We made it through another Sunday. So make sure that uh, if you're watching, subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you're listening on any podcast app, you can subscribe there. Leave us a uh, rating and or a review, which helps. And if you want to learn more about our, uh, serv- our professional service where we help people engage with life, not pull them away from it, it's the Life Process Program at lifeprocessprogram.com. Have a good one, Stanton, and thank well, you. Well, one last thing. The story mm. I told about myself are part of my memoir. Oh, yeah, please. Um, yeah, i got to remember to just remind me to do that because incredible uh, book. Uh, uh, Scientific Life on the Edge, My Lonely Quest to Change How We See Addiction. All of these stories tie in together around that. So uh, thanks for all your support, uh, Zach. I, I don't think I'll need professional health services today. I think I'm going to go to the beach instead. That's where I'm at. <laughs>